Welcome to WPKN 89.5 FM, listener-supported radio. Uh, today's guest is going to be Jenny De La Cruz, and she is the author of a children's book about helping children cope with COVID-19. And I have grandchildren, and I have friends with grandchildren, and some friends with children. <laughs> and all of them seem to be struggling right now with this whole problem with um, with the virus that's been around. It, it's changed so many things, and, and whatever is normal, Whatever used to be normal, um, a few things maybe still are, but so much has changed. And so I have a chance to, to visit with Jenny De La Cruz. And I did spend a little bit of time um, understanding that um, she's from New York. Um, she's also written another book that maybe if there's time we can talk about, Fridays with Miss Melange. And uh, it's history book. And given what's going on in our country today, that would be good to talk about too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's a lot. There's a lot. To, there's a lot to have on, on here with Jenny, and um, I'm going to ask Jenny to tell to tell my audience a little bit about herself. And uh, as you listen to Jenny, I, I hope that you come to really appreciate what she's done with this book that I I actually got to see on YouTube, and we can talk a bit about that as well. Because I asked Jenny if she had a copy of it that I might see, and she actually it's a, she does a delightful reading of the story with pictures on YouTube. And um, you. yeah. I encourage people to go see it when this is all over. Um, so, Jenny, I do. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your background and how you came to be a children's author? Yeah, sure. You know, um, I'm a licensed professional counselor of over ten years of experience, and um, you know, I work with uh, those who are struggling with trauma, relationship issues, grief, and loss, um, and just different challenges. And to be honest with you. Um, my children inspired me first to become a children's author. You would think it, it came out of my counseling. A little bit of some of that is related, but really um, my sons, my first book, Fridays with Miss Melange, as you mentioned, Haiti, was really born out of frustration because I wanted to teach my uh, six-year-old about the history of Haiti. My uh -huh. parents are from Haiti, believe it or not, and uh, I'm a first-generation American born in Brooklyn. And so um, I couldn't find anything. I think the closest thing I found was like a chapter book for older kids. And so my husband said, then why don't you just write it? And I said, well, okay maybe i'll just write something just for the house you know almost like you wear your house t-shirt you know mm -hmm. just for the house but i got so into it chuck that you know poured in research i said you know i really need to share this with others as well and that's when i decided to um publish and then from then i got the bug i guess <laughs> So how did you, I mean, I know, I know a lot of families are struggling with COVID-19. Did that come from your family too? Is that something that the kids were struggling with? I mean, I, just before we started, you mentioned that you are the camp counselor. There is no camp right now. And so, Seriously. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, my youngest now is the one that inspired me to write my second book, which is, um, can I sleep with you tonight? Mama, can I sleep with you tonight? Helping children cope with the impact of COVID-19. Now, I kid you not, April 5th at 4 a.m., he woke me up because he wanted to share his big fears and big feelings surrounding the coronavirus, you know? Because for children, um, you know, all these changes can be really hard, especially for really smaller children who are learning how to pick up facial cues, they see everyone wearing masks, right. and they can't tell. Is there a smile or a frown behind there? And that can be challenging. Right, right. It's actually, you know, in the world that I'm in, in emotional intelligence and counseling people about how to take uh, an understanding of how emotional abilities work and about their own emotional abilities, one of the key skills is looking at people's faces, and that's gone now. All you have is eyes for the most part at least in many places. Obviously, when you're social distance and you're with family members, that's, that's not, that's, that hasn't changed so much. If you're all, you know, used to, when you're living together, people are wearing masks when they're living together. But anytime you go to a store or a restaurant or out and about, most people are wearing masks in many places these days. Yeah, it's true. And, you know, it's important to know that children process uh, loss and change differently than we do. And, and so I talk about that in the book. is a story between you know, a mother comforting her son the best way she knows how. And at the end, I do provide like tools and resources that parents can access for free 
so that they're not struggling through this alone. And I do talk about the major stages of grief as well in this book. Um, at, well, one of the things that resonated with me, uh, Jenny, when I read your book was um, I Miss Hugs with Nana was one of the was one of the pages in that in the story. And, um, you know, uh, we're we're in the Nana camp. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, when we when we were with our grandkids, uh, we haven't been able to hug them. Now, yeah. we've started breaking that taboo a bit because, you know, everybody's trying very hard to be quarantined as much as possible. And so once we kind of established some boundaries about what was okay, we are not hugging our own children or our son-in-laws. We have three daughters and uh, we have three son-in-laws now, but we are hugging the grandkids. After the, the grandkids in New Jersey that come and visit, we're in Connecticut, um, the grandkids in New Jersey, they get tested before they come visit us. So we've had a couple weekends where they actually got tested right before they came. And because we've been very, quarantined. Uh, we're in that camp where we're old enough that we don't want to really expose ourselves. So we've been very careful, but even yeah. very careful. We still, again, we're hugging our grandkids because they took a test two or three days ago and you're still a little frightened. So, the, you know, we, and for a long time, that was the biggest part. The hardest part as a grandparent was not being able to see or hug our, our grandkids. Yeah. And that's tough, but I think that is so wise that you guys are taking those precautions you know and i think a lot of parents will be surprised to know that even with their their children to see the shift in behavior many kids when they're going through major change you might see an increase of mood swings and tantrums um and so it's important to note that that child not may not just be acting out but they may be going through grief you know like and the, the five major stages are denial anger sadness bargaining and acceptance. Um, the final sixth stage, which I didn't mention in my book, is really key and that's transformation. And I believe that we are going through a transformation. Well, we don't know how, we don't know how we come out on the other end of this tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we are seeing a little bit of light, but every once in a while it feels like the light gets blocked out because it feels like we're going backwards instead of forwards. Uh, it, I, I guess some good news is even though there's been a rise in cases in a lot of parts of the country, uh, there's been a significant decrease in deaths, and so um, that's that's the good news in all of this right now. So there, yeah. there's light that we're beginning to see in some places, and, and and things are beginning to open up and feel a little more normal. But I also I also know kids are going to be trying to figure out how to go to school, and one of my daughters is a special needs teacher, and it's yeah. so hard to turn, to think about how kids in schools with 20, 30 kids and used to working together as um, in groups to solve problems. How are they going to do that social distancing? I mean, uh, teachers scrambled last year to do online education, especially with special needs kids, some who couldn't afford a lot of yeah, technology. Yeah. Or, you know, I mean, there's so many things that are a struggle right now. I'm wondering how people have responded to your book. Have you gotten feedback from people who have read your book and with their children? And what have you heard? Yeah, you know, um, from reading the reviews and getting the emails that I've received, parents are sharing that they notice their ch their children are opening up more and sharing their feelings, which is great about the coronavirus. And parents are also saying that this book uh, can be applied to dealing with the impact of grief and major changes, just like, you know, unfortunately what we've seen with all the black lives that were lost on our screens right like Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and so this book is not just for the coronavirus but it's dealing with grief it's dealing with major change and so it can apply to those issues as well um but that these are the, the things that I've been um feedback I've been getting so um, I imagine the book resonates with all children, but one of the things that I noticed is that certain types of individuals, children have different reactions. Um, I have um, three grandchildren. One, one is an extreme extrovert and another is a somewhat introverted person. And there's a difference. The introverted person seems to enjoy time at home with parents and with her brother and 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 just being uh involved with her own artwork and um and her interest she's a she's a really smart young young girl but she's um she's misses friends too but not in the same way that her brother does who was engaged in 
lots of sports, very active, very smart, always helping other kids uh, with with their work when they couldn't when they couldn't um, when they couldn't learn something. He was one of those people called on in the classroom to help. And he loved doing that, and he was also really you know a good athlete. Um, and and he misses all the activity that involved with just being around friends and activities that engage people in team sports, team activities, whether in school or in athletics in some ways. And I found that um, even in my own home, my own wife is very extroverted. And I am so, sort of on the borderline between introvert and extrovert. So I like being with other people, but I'm fine without that. And, um, and my wife really misses it. I mean, she's very social and it's very important to her. So there's this sense of, um, it seems like it might be different and unique to different children. And I'm wondering if you've seen any different responses from anybody, either in your counseling or in your own home or with some of the people that have bought the book. Yeah, you know, it's funny because, you know, I have two boys and one of them happened to, happened to be an extrovert and the other an introvert. And I would say that you're absolutely right. Um, they may struggle with these changes differently, but I do find that they're both having difficulty. Um, but of course, the, the child who's extrovert is having um, even greater difficulty because extroverts get their energy from being around people, right? Right, right? And so it's almost like, what do you do with that? And so I, I find that I'm just trying to find creative ways for them to engage. Um, so we do a lot of Zoom, Zoom calls with family and friends. Uh, but you still want to be mindful of the screen time with the, the kids. So it, it's it's like a catch-22 here. Uh, but I do think that um, it's really important to get children to really engage with their um, senses, um, especially those children who may be extrovert and have a lot of energy. And so what can I do? How can I get them to engage in art and play to 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 um, fuel that energy source. I think that's important. So we really have to be creative. And, you know, I do provide tips, um, you know, for parents. Like if I can give just three tips for parents, I would just say, you know, definitely engage your children through art and play because this is the way they, this is their language. And I know you know this as a former school counselor, you know, this is the way they express themselves. And I would also, the second tip I would say, validate, validate, you know, say, I feel angry too. I feel frustrated too about these changes because what that does is allow them to say, see that we're not superheroes. A lot of times they look <laughs> up to us you know, I'm, they think they're the only ones struggling, like, because we try to hold it all together, but sometimes we're not only doing ourselves a disservice, but them a disservice, because if they can see that we're, we're having a hard time, too, they may feel more open to come to us to share their frustration. So it really creates that safe place, Chuck, and I would say the last um, tip is, you know, not only give our kids, but give ourselves the opportunity to release any anger or frustration physically so i may say to one of my clients like if your child's frustrated have him or her go to their room and punch their pillow you know let that frustration out and it might be a win-win situation they take a nap you get a break but even exercise you know <laughs> it's so important for us not just to be in shape but to release that tension from our body it really calms our central nervous system because it's so much of ch of change that we have to deal with and it could be hard one of the things that one of my daughters has done is um she uh, she's she's trying to be very active physically mm -hmm. uh she's very uh she's she tries very hard to stay fit in in good times and now she's found a way to get a routine together and she they she got um her her son a, a fitbit watch and the two of them now uh, have had days where they compete for the number of steps that they do. <laughs> I love activities. it. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I've done over the years, uh, Jenny, was to, to create something called an emotion roadmap. And I was telling you about that earlier. And on my radio show, the tagline is take the wheel and control how you feel. If you're not feeling the way you want to or need to, then ask yourself what would be ideal to feel and what could you do to create those feelings? And so one of the things I saw in your book was, um, you know, what will we do when things get to be normal was one of the questions. 
And you said, I'd like to go get an ice cream. I'll get a chocolate sundae or I'll get a vanilla cone. And then, um, and then the mama and she suggested to her boy that, hey, how about if we create the stuff that we can make our own ice cream at home? Which, by the way, sounded pretty good, like a good idea to me. <laughs> I'm thinking about that now. <laughs> I love it. But, yeah. but, but what a fun thing. And, but, it was, but to me, it was more the idea that, hey, what can we do? As opposed yeah. to sitting back and feeling bad and just saying, hey, don't feel that way. You know, we're all dealing with it. Get over it. <laughs> Which is how you get when sometimes you feel frustrated. and You, you just yeah. want everybody to move on because you run out of ideas. So that's why I saw your book and I thought, boy, more ideas, more ways to think about what you can do and how to talk to your, your son or daughter. And, and, I, and I love the idea that when you said that other people who are reading your book, the kids are opening up more because I... You know, as a, a years and years ago, a long time ago, I started uh, as a as a school counselor, and I worked in junior highs and with elementary school kids from kindergarten on. And I found kids had a hard time talking about feelings. One of the things I used to do is I, I used to have something we called Magic Circle, and it was a way of teaching kids about how to deal with their feelings. And we'd come together uh, as a group, and we'd say, first of all, you have to know that anything you say in here, you can feel safe because nobody's going to laugh. And everybody's going to repeat what they heard before they can talk. By the what, repeat what they heard the, the last person say. So everybody's going to be listened to. Everybody's going to listen in order to speak and have to take a turn. And then I'd say, so today we're going to talk about, and I, it'd be a, uh, a day that we talk about a particular feeling, like how do you deal with sadness? And so does anybody have a story about a time that they were sad and what they did about it and how, and how it impacted them? And then people would repeat that. And then at the end, you'd ask, did, we, did anybody's stories sound the same? So somehow finding a way to encourage kids to talk about their feelings, which I, I love which, that. which what you just said your book does, is, um, is, is a great way to think about how to help. I'm just thinking out loud now that maybe people could do that in their own families while they're sitting at home now around the, around the dinner table. People spending lots more time at home looking for creative ways to be together. And maybe you could take a different night each night and just say, Let's just talk about how we deal with anger. Anybody ever feel ashamed? Anybody ever have, be embarrassed? I mean, those are the, there's a lot of feelings that are really tough that yeah. only through trial and error is how we deal with them. And most families don't really spend much time trying to think through how they might help their children because they don't know how. And this is one way that I think is a, is a way to create a sense of in your home, it's okay to talk about feelings. Yeah. One of my good friends is, um, or not a good friend, but a colleague and a friend, is Mark Brackett. He's the director of um, uh, the Center of Emotional Intelligence at Yale University. And he wrote a book called Permission to Feel. Mm. And it's about his experience growing up and how he struggled over time with um, his own feelings. And how it wasn't, feelings weren't appreciated or talked about in his home until he got to know his uncle really well, who encouraged him to let his feelings out. He was struggling with a lot of things when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, he felt okay and, and he felt like a human being when he was allowed to speak freely with his uncle about his feelings. And I think your book helps to encourage kids to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, talking about, talking about feelings, I think, you know, there is um, a game called Feelings and Dealings. And it's like a, a emotions and empathy card game. Folks can get from Amazon. I think I believe it's geared towards ages three to six. So I mean, there's so many tools out here. You know, you just have to Google. And you, I mean, right now we're living in a day and age where sometimes it's too much information. So, you know, I I would definitely encourage folks. You know, and myself, I'm always trying to find what kind of tools I can use to help. What, what, what was the name of the game? It's called Feelings and Dealings. Feelings and dealings. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, it's funny because I have a um, there's a book that on the top of my head, uh, it's called B is for Breathe, and this is a book uh, for young children that talks about feelings and it lists coping skills from the alphabet. They use the alphabet from A to Z to list different types of coping skills, and this is by um, another mental health. Um, pr practitioner uh, who goes by the name of Dr. Melissa Boyd and so that's another great resource too for families. 
So I was curious when I saw that your book was on YouTube. Um, now I, I imagine people might just go there and see the book. So that's it's not. I mean, it's I, I'm I've also decided you know be on the radio show and yeah, hopefully. Um, well, my my <laughs> my goal is is I have large um, large goals. So I I think that anytime if I can help people find inner peace, that the more people who feel inside peaceful inside themselves um the better chance we have for world peace so you know, those are those are my large aspirations um, I love it. And, and so so the goal is to help and, and part of why we don't feel inner peace is because we don't know how to manage emotionally um you know what goes on inside of us a lot of us and so one of the things that i was struck by was that so if you if you make your book available for free on youtube because anybody can see it um, so do, does that encourage people to buy your book, or you're just fine with that? And you're giving it, you're yeah, giving yeah. A, giving away what you've done with your creativity. Yeah, you know, to be honest yeah. with you, I've I've made my books available on YouTube, and I also shared other books from various authors because I wanted to make sure there was no barriers. You know, if especially in light of um, COVID nineteen, so many people are unemployed and have been for months, and so that might not be the first thing on their mind is to purchase some children's books. And so I wanted to make sure that everyone had access to the book in hopes that people would love it and say, you know what, let's support this artist, let's support this mom and also author as well. Um, and so I kind of leave that up to, to individuals to do that on their own. But um, yeah, that's why I've, uh, made it available. And to be honest with you, my YouTube channel called Storytime with Miss Melange actually um, started before I became an author. I started this channel to celebrate children's books that promoted diversity. And in collecting various books and reading out loud for my sons and other children, um, I began to imagine, wow, it would be great if there was a book about this or this. And, you know, and when I didn't see those books, I said, maybe I should write them. And so, believe it or not, uh, my YouTube channel preceded my um, life as an author. So that's really interesting. So you went in search of certain kinds of books, didn't see them, and then decided to write them. Yeah. Good for you. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Hey, you want to Thank tell you. me a little bit about um, Fridays with Miss Melange and what that's about? Sure. Fridays with Miss Melange, Haiti. Um, pretty much. I'm going ahead and grab it so you know, you guys can see it. Um, it's a book about a young girl around age 12 named Nia, who uh, she loves to explore history with her favorite teacher, uh, Miss Melange. And um, each Friday, they go through an adventure where they study a region. And this, this book kind of has a feel of, if you can compare it to maybe an urban version of the Magic School Bus, but instead of science, your focus is on history. And so this is a, big, a start of a series of focusing on world history and current events. And this book obviously is about the history of Haiti. And it's a beautiful history. And of course, uh, my family's history. And so I wanted to share not only with my sons, but the world. And many don't realize, but Haiti's constitution was actually the first constitution that stated that all people are created equal. And that constitution uh, was drafted and when Haiti declared independence from France in 1804. So when you say it was written, you say the Constitution was written, it was the first one to write that? Well, it was the first one to acknowledge that all men are created equal because you have to remember in 1804, slavery was still happening all over uh, the world. So this was revolutionary. In fact, it was, it was so revolutionary, it was seen as a rebellion. And um, Haiti had the audacity to say that if any enslaved African was to travel to the shores of Haiti, that person would be free. So it was just like unheard of. Wow. You know? No, I didn't know that. No, that's yeah. pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first time that it was uh, all men were created equal and they meant it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's very interesting. Um, and when when that was happening, was uh, it was a colony of France, and was there an uprising and a war that 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 caused the that caused the French to leave? Yeah, it, it, it was a it was an uprising. It took twelve years. Um, they uh, Haiti fought against the France, um, Spain, a number of. It, it was really interesting, but I, I believe that. Um, you know, I don't want to give too much away. You really have to check out the book, oh, you know. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's available on Amazon as well and Barnes okay. & Noble and on my website, copscreekpublishing.com. Okay, well, that's great. And so how long have you been an author? When did this all start for you? Oh, my goodness. It started, I, I mean, I, it, it hasn't even been a year. I'm still, I'm still fresh. The ink is still wet. Okay, so I published my first book in December of 2019 and then my second book um mama can i sleep with you tonight i published this on june 1st and so yeah i it's def i'm definitely um just getting started and it's it's really have been an a exciting journey where i'm learning so much do you in your practice and your counseling practice see families and children primarily or do you see anybody yeah, you know what? Um, when I started my practice, I primarily focused on children and families. Um, but because of, um, of course, the changes that we all have to take because of um, the social distancing, and now that I'm watching my own children during the day, um, I only can have sessions in the evening when I put them down to sleep. And so I, I have only been working with um, couples and adults at this time because of that. But I do work with all um, sorts of populations, and I specialize in um, providing service to couples, those who, you know, as I mentioned before, experience trauma, domestic violence, relationship issues. But I, I used to um, engage in play therapy uh, with children. That's a really interesting world. I, that's a, that's a sort of unique niche in the counseling world where people who understand how play what play means i mean lots of people play with their children obviously but you have insights then that um what are you looking for when you watch kids play when you do that kind of work yeah you know it's really interesting um i i believe like with play therapy um you know, I'm looking for children as they play to share their narrative. And I really pay close attention to what they're saying, their body language, even their artwork. Um, and I think that's really important. I have even uh, used that tool to even help my youngest to process some of the struggles with all these changes. I remember for instance, um, when I went to the grocery store and he asked me, mom, can you pick up some Oreos? and I kid you not, Chuck, they were out of Oreos. I couldn't stand Clorox wipes for Oreos. But anyway, I came back home and I said, I said, they were out of Oreos. And he just looked puzzled. I said, you know, because of, you know, what's going on and everybody is, this is when, you know, people are really just grabbing so much, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, he just looked perplexed and he seemed like he was okay. He started playing. And then maybe two days later, he just seemed more frustrated than usual. And I, I gave him a piece of paper and some crayons. I said, go ahead and draw how you feel and draw something. So he was drawing and he was really digging in there, you know, with the crayon. And next thing I know, he's drawing a picture of me. So I said, wait, hold up for a minute. <laughs> and then I said, what's going on? And he said, mommy, you're at the supermarket and see, you're stomping your feet. You're so angry. There's no more Oreos. Look, you're, you're <laughs> mad. And I said, wow. And you know, be mindful. He was not at the supermarket with me. So um, <laughs> this was his way of processing that wow. frustration and you know i'm glad he had that tool because let's say he would have took it out on his older brother and they would have got into it i would have not known where the source came from you know well you might have guessed it was the missing oreos <laughs> 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 yeah, that's interesting. So, so you did play therapy, and now you're doing uh, your counseling sessions over the uh, Zoom. Zoom is that how you're doing them these days? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I use a, a platform called Doxy Me, and um, it's 
similar like Zoom, you get a link or whatever, and it's a confidential link, but this is like for um, practitioners and so, but it's very similar to Zoom. And pretty much, yeah, I, I have like uh, 50 minute sessions with my clients through Zoom and, you know, it's, it's different, but it's, it's very helpful. And I think it's really um, very useful for those who just in general have a hard time get into office, you consider those who may be handicapped or even um, right. deployed in the military, you know, right. it's just great to have this, this, this platform to do that. So that's really interesting. So the idea of um, Zoom hasn't slowed you down. I, I know from some people I know that are friends that are therapists, it seems like some of their work is really, at, well, not just therapists, but leadership coaches too. The, the lots lots more people seem to need more help these days. I don't know. Is your practice have you have you had clients seemingly more needy these days? Yeah, I would say yeah, absolutely. Of course, the under needs I believe are amplified by the stress that we're all experiencing. You know, for one, um, you have couples who may have had underlying issues that they kept hidden under the rug, but now that they're home all day with each other they have to deal with these issues. And they said, wow, we might as well need couples therapy. So I, I believe too, Chuck, a lot of these issues were issues that people kept putting off. And now they said, well, it's not like I have you know, much to do these days. It's, you know, it's not like I can go out and do X, Y, and Z or watch my sports show. I might yeah, as well yeah. deal with these issues in front of me. Right. That, I think um, you, you hit on something. Uh, one of the other fellows that I had on as an interview the other day was, um, he's a sports psychologist who works for all, all the, the major sports, um, um, uh, Major League Baseball for the Minnesota Twins, and, the, and um, he works with the football team in Minnesota at college and professional levels. Same thing with the NBA. So and he, he says, I mean, it, the work is like unbelievable right now because these are all people used to competing at extremely high levels, and they're not doing much at all. And they're trying to decide, how, you know, how much... How, how much can I work out every day and, and, and with no real goal in sight and, and no real, and now, now it's starting to change a bit because we, we look like we're going to have an explosion of sports at the end of this month, you know, so, yeah. um, but it also meant that every fan that was used to spending, I don't know, six to 12 hours a week, maybe, maybe even more watching sports, um, it's gone. And I, I'm a, I'm a big, I'm from Boston and originally in the Boston area and, all Boston, also all Boston teams. Yeah. And so I missed it big time. That, that, is, a, that is a big miss. Um, and so I think one of the things that happened to your point was that, so we're home, my, my wife and I, with all this time. And now, I mean, we're, we've been together a long time. So it's not like um, the stories, you know, the stories of the stories, whatever they are. And there's not yeah. a lot of new things to talk about. And so there's a different way of relating. And one of the things that I found useful that I've shared before in other shows where I've been on is this idea of deep listening. Just, you know, um, sometimes when we're passing each other, we listen sort of uh, in a cursory way. We just sort of, we're paying attention and we hear, and then we're sort of moving on. Yeah. And we just don't, don't fully attend to what somebody else is saying. And now, um, although I, lately I've gotten really busy, but even, even now I'm trying as hard as I can to make sure that I listen to anything and everything about a story that my wife wants to tell me in ways I, I really hadn't been before. Uh, and that seems to be helpful for me and for her. And um, so I think it's something I encourage people, just really listen harder and longer and make sure you really hear what's being intended not just the words but what the feelings are and, and what the message is that may not really be stated clearly and and try as hard as you can to make sure that you know that you've really heard everything by being reflective and asking is there anything else you'd like to say about that yeah i think that's wonderful i mean it just reminds me of the idea of being present you know right and it's a gift the present is a gift you're never gonna get again so might as well really take it in it is a present in that way <laughs> yeah being present is, is is a big part of it that's that's funny and you say that one of the things that when i teach about uh, others about emotional intelligence and 
how to be um, more informed about how they're feeling. You mentioned breathing a little, a little while ago. I try to explain feelings in a similar way to the way I talk about breathing. Uh, and what I suggest to people is that until I say to, a, to an audience or to a group of people I'm talking to, I said, I noticed that you're all breathing. Everybody says, oh, right, right. You know, they, they, they smile a bit. But, yeah. But at the same time, I said, but I don't think you were thinking about breathing. You were just breathing. And I said, that's about the feelings are similar. We're always feeling something, but unless they're overwhelming, like labored breathing, you know, you're breathing when you've just come off a run or something and, you know, you're, you're huffing and puffing. You're very, you're very focused and aware of your breathing then. And that's sort of how emotions tend to work too. Unless we're really feeling strong emotions, we don't often think about the emotions we're feeling. Yeah. One of the things that I learned about the science of emotion is that certain emotions are better for particular tasks than other emotions. So if you've got something important you're trying to do and the feelings you have are not the ideal feelings and you stop and reflect and realize that the feelings you have may not be, how, they may even be an obstacle to what you're trying to get done. And that's the concept of an emotion roadmap. So if what you're feeling isn't helpful, isn't what you need to feel, what would be ideal to feel and how do you get there? Mm, how do you get I love there? it. Yeah, that's the idea of planning. That's why I liked your book so much because um, you, were, you were doing things like, like creating an ice cream store in your house, making your own ice cream, thinking about what are we going to do tomorrow? I try to, you know, I was trying to help uh, one of my daughters with this, with trying to plan. I even talked to my grandson about it. Um, I said, you know, if you're not feeling great about your day, you know, what about, you know, having a calendar? He's very tech savvy, right? And you know, how about having a calendar and you plan things that you know you want to do? So at two o'clock on Thursday, you're going to shoot baskets with your dad. On Wednesday, you're going to play checkers with your friend on a Zoom conference. On Friday, you're going to go visit with some friends and you social distance, but you'll see him and you can talk with him. Just so you know, every day you got something. So while I was telling him all this, yeah. he was sitting down looking so incredibly bored. I took a picture of him with my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I said, someday you'll appreciate this. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, but, yeah, it's funny. Yeah. Because, you know, it's, it's like you have the young ones who just keeps climbing on you. And then they get to the age where they don't want to be bothered. You can't win. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, I think there's a there's a lot of a lot of things to do, and it it sounds like you're just at the beginning of of your time as an author. Have you had other ideas about books you want to write, or are your the ideas just come to you? How does that work? For yeah. You? Yeah. You know what? To be honest with you, a lot of my um, followers are not only parents but teachers, and I've been really paying close attention to some of. the their concerns and you know i've actually in the process of publishing a guide so this will be a guide for um parents and educators and it's going to be called um, it's going to be released this august wow so good for you. um thank you and it's it's going to be called how was your summer fostering critical conversations with students post-COVID and Black Lives Matters. And this is gonna be full of um, activities, about 30 activities um, that teachers can utilize. It's really short, about 15 minutes, maybe once a week or every other week. And it's geared towards uh, grades K through 12. And I did that so that it can be comprehensive. So I have activities broken down for different um, age levels. And it's interesting because you were sharing about create a, a new routine with your grandson. And that is something, one of the activities that I mentioned in the book, like how to create a new routine when your routine has been destroyed, right? Because we learned that from COVID. So really trying to teach students skills that they normally don't get maybe in a classroom because we're so focused on preparing for the test, right? The standardized test at the end of the year. But I think it's important to also focus on their emotional health as well so it's a teacher's guide is it going to be um tailored to a certain level of of a uh, child or like is it like kindergarten first grade mm -hmm. all, all grades or how, how does yeah it work? yeah so it's going to be all grades and in each activity i mentioned okay from k through second grade you might want to tailor it this way so i do get suggestions for various age groups 
so that the teachers can tailor it. But I wanted I wanted it to be K through 12 so that it's comprehensive and that it can be useful um, to all teachers. Uh, so will you, because uh, I've done some things along these lines in my previous years and as a school counselor, um, sometimes there were, um, if, if, as you think of curriculum, the way I think of it is that you start with a base foundation that starts right. in, in kindergarten, mm -hmm. and then each year it kind of builds. Now, some of the things are duplicate or, or, or you know, are replicated from one year to the next because we're dealing with anger as a, as a five-year-old and we're dealing with it as a 15-year-old. And it's not quite, the, I mean, we're still feeling anger. Right. It's not the same reasons why we feel anger. Yeah. It's not and we don't have the same responses to anger. So, um, so is it going to change at different grade levels? That, that's a lot oh, of work. Yeah, that's absolutely. And so I'll give you an example, right? Um, so for one activity, like you mentioned, talking about, you know, we talk about the highlights of the summer, but then we talk about the difficult times or the challenging parts of the summer, right? And so this is actually, in this activity, the younger children are using um, art to express themselves, right? Because when you're thinking about a kindergarten or a first grader, they don't have all the, um, the language skills um, to perhaps write a paragraph or so. Maybe right. for the older students, maybe towards third and sixth grade, they're they're making a song about it, about you know, and so and then for the older kids, it's a, of course high school students, it's a paragraph, so it really is different, but they're all talking about the same theme, but the way they're presenting it is different. It's age appropriate, and so and you know, I I, I am I'm actually. Um, I have a few teachers that are helping me edit it right now. So it's still okay. in, the, in working stages and, you know, because I have a clinician, a counseling mindset. And so I don't know how it's like to run a classroom of 15 to 20 students. You know, that's a whole ball game, different ball game, you know, when you're dealing with someone one-on-one -on -one or a small group. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm definitely getting a lot of help, which is very, very useful. Well, that's great. And where where do you think you'll be able to like implement it? Do you have a client that's willing to try it out and give yeah. you some feedback? Yeah, I have a few um, friends that I found on Instagram. Um, and for those who want to follow me, I'm at Storytime Melange. But yeah, and so I've been like, you know, reaching out to different teachers from there and say, hey, can I send you a, you know, a copy before it's, you know, published so that you can check it out. Let me know your thoughts. Yeah, because I definitely do want that feedback and to be able to, you know, but if you know anyone, you know, you could hook me up, Chuck, after the. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I could share it with my daughter. She's a special needs teacher. And awesome. um, um, that's, I mean, right now I, I, I have a friend of mine who is very active as he works for that Center for Emotional Intelligence at school. By the way, one of the things, you know, given what you're doing, you might find interesting, is um, this friend, this fellow, Mark Brackett, he mm -hmm. created um, something with a, a program called Ruler. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, it was recognize, understand, label, express, and regulate emotions. Wow, I like that. Recognize, understand, I got to remember, sorry, remember, recognize, <laughs> understand, label, express, and, um, and regulate emotions. So RULER was the idea of an acronym for school, but it was about all these things about emotional literacy, emotional mm -hmm. expression, emotional management, emotional understanding. And so he's created a curriculum similar to what you're talking about, kindergarten through 12th grade, that is mm -hmm. integrated. He, he, he didn't want to create more burdens on the schools. So he mm -hmm. tried to find ways to integrate um, the emotional aspects into into regular curriculum. So here's a, a quick take on what that means. Um, his uncle was the original person. Remember I said that he had an uncle who helped him, encourage him to feel, allow him yeah. to uh, ex express his feelings. So he stayed very close to his uncle for a lot of years. He got trained by the pioneers in emotional intelligence when he was getting his PhD. Went to There were two of them. One was Peter Salovey, who's now president of Yale. And another was the University of New Hampshire psychologist named Jack Mayer. And he got yeah. his PhD working un under Jack Mayer at the University of New Hampshire, and then went to work for Peter Salovey, 
uh, made Yale University. And so he's worked really closely with the, with the authors of Emotional Intelligence. But what his uncle had conceived of many, many years ago, which I know you like, is that his uncle felt like when he's teaching history, which is what you have done with your book about Haiti, um, when he's teaching history, he felt that I can't ask kids to remember everything I tell them because they just, I mean, just, they're just facts. They're, they, you know, they, they won't, when they leave the room, it's going to be hard for them to remember what we talked about unless I can make them feel what we're talking about. And so we give this example of when Caesar went to the Roman Senate and said to the, all of the senators, this is my new law. You all have to obey and implement my new law. You all have to. And no one challenged him and he walked away. He'd ask his students, has anyone ever come to you and told you you had to do something and you had no choice? Have you ever felt like somebody was so powerful you were afraid to, to react in any way other than to just accommodate what they had said that they wanted you to do. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden kids start talking about those experiences with people like that. And then he'd ask, have you ever been like Caesar? How did you think the other people felt when you were? And so it, it was a way to, all of a sudden, you're not going to forget that lesson when, yeah, when it's taught it. you that way, right? I love it. And it's multiple yeah. lessons too. It's like layers. Yes. Awesome. Yes. So, and so Mark loved that concept. I mean, we all did. We all thought that was great. Uh, there's a few of us working together with Mark and his uncle. And um, we all said, that's wonderful. But Mark then started to think about a curriculum beyond just that one history course in, uh, in the high school that his, his uncle taught. Um, can we do this across the board with uh, lots of lessons and lots of lesson plans, K through 12? Can we involve the entire school system? because kids, as you know, are impacted not just with the one teacher that they have, but they go home to whatever environment, sometimes really healthy, sometimes not so much. Um, they also are on the playground without teachers at school. Some are very talented and get picked for teams, others don't, you know, left out. Some very social, others, you know, kind of off by themselves without people to play with them. So there's lots of different kinds of programs out there that are trying to help kids with these kind of things. Another oh, place okay. to look, by the way, that I think is doing a great job yeah. is um, um, what happened in Newtown. You know, the, the, the promise, uh, Sandy Hook Promise has created a bunch of programs that are, are helpful along the lines of where you're going with what you want to do as well. Um, yeah. So anyway, those are some thoughts of other resources for parents to check out as well. Awesome. I appreciate that. Well, we're, we're just about out of time, Jenny. And um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we, we conclude to any, uh, you know, anybody listening? I would say, you know, um, just to be mindful that we're all human, you know. Um, we, I really want to break the stigma that surrounded mental health. And, you know, I'm always the first to say, as a licensed therapist, I also get therapy. Because, you know, radical times call for radical self-care. And so there's no shame in getting support. If you need it, do your thing. Thank you. I, I heard that on, on your YouTube video too. And I thought mm -hmm. that was nice because um, I think it's really important for kids to understand that they're adult role models. Um, they struggle, we all struggle. And because yeah. it, in some ways, instead of having to be that, that stone, that rock, that wall that can always be there for the child, I think that children need to understand that we all are struggling at times. We all have to look inwardly to find strength. And sometimes we need others to help us to find our strength. And I think that that's a good message for kids to understand because mm -hmm. otherwise they feel like they're not good enough because yeah. I, can't, I can't be like dad or I can't be like mom because they seem to have it all together. And I, I don't. Inside, I'm afraid and sometimes. And, and I'm afraid to talk about that. But wait, dad's talking about that. Mom's talking about that. I guess it's okay to be afraid too. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Jenny, for being a guest on our show. And I hope people buy your book. If they want to buy it, do they go to Cobbs Creek Publishing? Is that the best place to go? Yes, go to CobbsCreekPublishing.com. And, you know, you check it out from there. You can also visit your local um, bookstore because, you know, these local businesses are struggling. And you can actually order it from there as well. Thanks so much, Jenny. And appreciate all your time that you spent with me this morning. And uh, Thank you. best of luck in the future. You as well, Chuck. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye now.